My guest today is Jason Bach. Jason, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing really well. It's been a long time since I've seen you. So long, in fact, that you have a new job. <laughs> yes, I do. It's like a new job. What's, what are you doing? So I'm a developer advocate at Rocket Mortgage, which technically is still Quicken Loans, but they officially announced the name change is coming at the end of July. So mm -hmm. using Rocket Mortgage now. So yeah, I've been there for just over a year now. I celebrated my one-year anniversary on June 12th. What a year that been, huh? Yeah, it was, you know, there's a whole long story I could probably share over a couple of beers on this, but, uh, you know, the, uh, yeah, well, once, you know, once we can finally get the conferences we'll and we can see each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, but long story short, you know, I had been at a consulting company for 20 years and done consulting for 23. And, you know, I, th I think it just got to a point where the, the interests I had and the things I wanted to do, um, they were kind of starting to diverge a little bit. And this opportunity came up at Rocket and it seemed like it was a good fit. And I said, yeah, let's do this. Even though there's a pandemic and all this stuff for kicking in, it was, it, it took a while for me to come to that decision though, but you know, I'm, I'm glad that I made it. So. Oh, good. Well, congratulations to you and to Rocket Mortgage. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, even though I live in Chicago, Detroit is my hometown. So I know a lot of folks. Oh. There's a lot of good okay. people. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so. When I invited you on the show, I asked you what you want to talk about, and you gave me a couple of options, but one of them was something called mutation testing. And I wanted to talk about this because um, you won't believe this, but I know absolutely nothing about <laughs> mutation testing. I had never even heard the phrase before. Can, yeah. Can you tell me what is mutation testing? Sure. Um, I'll get into that, but I, I think this it's an interesting point because I want to give you a couple of topics. Um, my knowledge of mutation testing is probably about that much more than yours in, in that I had heard about it and then I, and then I saw a presentation on it that I think really clarified it. And, and that's the thing about technology is in, in our, in our business and what we do there's so much to learn about, and there's a lot of concepts that have been around, like that's mutation the, that's testing. The worst part of this job, isn't it? Well, yeah, yeah, it's a double-edged sword. There's th this concept of mutation testing that's been around since I think like the '60s or '70s, but it really hasn't started to become a thing that people use until relatively recently. And part of that is because of computational resources. It's, it takes a lot to do, oh, um, okay. but it, it's one of these things that. It's it's an idea that I've heard of, but it didn't click. And this has happened before. You know, uh, for example, uh, doing mocking and testing. Um, I had heard about it, but it never clicked. It never made sense. I didn't understand why you wanted to do it. And the first time somebody introduced me to the concept, I kind of like said, "No, I don't want to do this." It's, it it was confusing. It you know, it was just like, "Why why do this? It seems like a waste of time." But that what it took actually is a specific framework um, and substitute that really made it simple and easy to understand. And that's when the gears clicked, you know, that's when the key went in and everything started to unlock and make sense. Same thing with mutation testing in that I saw a presentation on it about a week or two ago. Mm -hmm. And it finally, even though I heard of this idea and kind of what it was, that helped clarify a lot about what it actually is doing. So, you know, it's just what I wanted to make that point because, you know, sometimes people may struggle with a, a new concept or a new idea. And that's why I tell people, even if you want to do a blog article or a video on a topic that other people have done, you may be expressing it in a way that's going to make it click for somebody else that another person with the way they explain it, it won't, you know, so totally agree. feel free feel free, you know, to go out and talk about it because you may be helping out somebody and, and helping them understand what it is. So, yeah. so what is mutation testing? Oh, can you and tell I'll me say, who, who gave the presentation? Um, I can get you the link to it. I, I unfortunately do not remember the name of the person. Okay. Um, it did come I'll, through. I'll a, I know that. Yeah. It's the, the group that it was through was Dan Clark. He runs a group in Oxford and they did a bunch of lightning talks. And one of the persons that did a lightning talk was on this framework called Striker. 
And that's where that's the talk that made me go, oh, okay, now I get it. So, um, but I can get you a link to the specific talk later. Um, to, to answer your question, what is mutation testing? You know, I knew you were going to ask it. And so I was thinking about how am I going to answer this question? And I, and I thought, well, I'm going to explain it the way I explain it to my wife because she's not a developer. You know, she, she has her, her talents and her, and, and things that she does really, really well in other areas like art. She's extremely talented as a, as an artist, but as a developer, that's, that's just not what she does. So we were actually going for a walk and I was, and she's like, I was telling her, Hey, I'm really excited about this new thing. I've been learning about mutation testing. She's like, what is it? And so it's that idea of, if you understand something well, you should be able to make it simplistic enough for anybody to understand. And so I, I said, okay, in my mind, I'm a challenge accepted. Let's see if I can do this. So I said, think of if you were asked to build something that added two numbers. Okay. Fairly simple. You right. take A and you take B and you multiply and you add them together and you're going to get a, you're going to get a result back. Okay. So you want to make sure that you've done it correctly though. So what do you do? You write a test. So you write a test that says, I'm going to call this method that says add. I'm going to pass in two and I'm going to pass in three. And what I expect to get back is a five. Right. This is that whole arrange act assert that you do in testing. Okay. But it's that last part that's also key is the assertion. I want to make sure that not only did I just call it, but that I've asserted it in a way that says I expected to get this value and that's what I got. If for some reason I got four back, well, that's wrong. Something that's not that's not matching my expectation. Okay. So she's like, okay, I get that. And I'm like, okay, cool. That makes sense. But how do we know that our tests are good? How do, how do I know that if somehow that gets changed to a minus, somehow somebody inadvertently is changing code and they and maybe they did this wide refactoring and then unfortunately it changed the plus to minus. Somehow that happened. Well, if I had just called in my test the method, but I didn't insert what the value was, I'll never notice that the implementation is incorrect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've seen in my past where people will do this, they'll write tests, without some form of assertion, without some form of you know, verifying that it's working the way they expect. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is people will say, well, my code coverage numbers are high because <laughs> code, cover code coverage is this metric that people use to say how much of my code was actually exercised under the tests, okay? And even useful and, tests add to that number. Well, yes. And All about the yeah, that and you know, to be fair, some people really are negative about code coverage numbers. And I'm not that negative because it's a metric just like anything else. And I think there is some value there. But the problem with code coverage is good tests will naturally have high code coverage numbers. But the reverse isn't true. Right. Just because you have high code coverage numbers doesn't mean your tests are good. Right. So like I, when I was reading about mutation testing, I heard the phrase, who watches the watchers? And way back in when I was starting to learn unit testing, that's where some people get you know, cynical about it too. Well, great, now you write tests. Well, how do you know that your tests are good? You write tests against your tests and how far down the turtles do you go? <laughs> and I said, well, that's kind of ridiculous, but there is a fair point. How do you know your tests are actually of good quality? And so that's what mutation testing is trying to do. It's gonna look at your code and find certain operations, certain things that you're doing and say, what happens if I would just change this from a plus to a minus? What should happen is a test somewhere should fail. And that's actually good. Oh. Because if I have a test that's saying I call add and I pass in two and three and I'm asserting five, if I suddenly change that to a subtract and now I get two minus three, which would be a minus one, my assertion will fail, my test will fail. But with mutation testing, that's saying that's a good thing. You know, you, you'll hear the phrase, you make a mutant in your code and you want to, this sounds a little negative, but you want to kill the mutants. You want to get rid of them. The more that you get rid of, that means that your code is actually defending against unexpected changes, that you're asserting the right things. Okay, so that, in a, you know, so I explained that to my wife and she was like, 
oh, okay, I can kind of get that. And that's essentially what mutation testing is doing. It's trying to find places in your code to change it to see if any of your tests are going to fail. And if they do, that's actually good. Oh, interesting. Uh, so uh, tell me about the implementation of this. Is this something we do by hand or is there an automated process that would go in and uh, yeah, break if, our tests? If you, yeah, if you did it by hand, that would be a mind numbing exercise. <laughs> that would be really, really just very hard to keep track of everything and, and bookkeep and all that other stuff. So fortunately, there are frameworks out there that already do this this thing. And the the one that I've been looking at, and it seems like a lot, you know, when you talk about mutation testing, it, it, does, it comes up because it's not just for .NET, which is where I pretty much live in my life, but they, I think, also have one for Scala and also for JavaScript, um, and it's called Striker. So again, I'll, I'll give you the link later on that you can put in the notes if you want. But it's, it's a framework that essentially, the way it works in .NET is it's a .NET tool. So you install it, and all you have to do then is run .NET Striker, and that's it. What it's going to do is, assuming that you're doing that command in a directory that has tests, um, it's going to look and see, well, okay, this code, this test project is actually referencing this other project. And it has to do this on a code level. So it, you know, there are testing frameworks or mutation testing frameworks that will actually change the bytecode. This one actually changes your code, um, but it doesn't do it to disk. It's, you know, the, the details are pretty dense and I don't know exactly what it's doing, but I believe it's changing a version of your code in memory and then running the tests against that, okay? So it will look for, again, certain operations and certain things and say, if I find this in your code, then I'm going to change it to this operation and then we'll run tests and see if it fails. So all you have to do as a developer is install the tool, run .NET Striker, go get a cup of coffee or whatever your favorite beverage is because it does take some time to run. Okay. It's kind of analogous if you've ever used benchmark.net, wonderful performance testing framework, but it can take some time to, to run and get all the numbers that it does. Same thing with Striker. So you let it run, and you let the progress bar go all the way to the end, and then it gives you a report. And what you can do is look at that report, and it will tell you where it found and did mutations and which ones survived. And so then it, you can actually click on your CS file, because that shows up in the report as a link. You can click on it, and then it brings in your code, and then it will actually show you where all the mutations were done and which ones didn't actually, you know, that no tests pass, or I should say no tests failed because those are the ones you want to look at and say, oh, what did I miss here? You know, why didn't this fail? And that can start to get you on this discovery path of going, maybe I need to shore up my tests and make sure I'm actually covering the expected yeah, case. Right, they could not necessarily have code coverage, but those case coverages. I'm yes. Not, here's an obvious error, or maybe not, maybe an unobvious error that, uh, that my tests aren't covering. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I've got an edge case somewhere that I didn't take into account. Uh, is it yeah. is it only um is it looking at all the code and changing all the code or is it looking specifically at code that is part of your test coverage? It's yeah, it's just looking at code that's part of your test coverage. I, I I'm sense. almost positive of that, and it's not like going to try to drill down into, well, this is referring to this assembly which is part of some Microsoft package and let's go off and do that one. It doesn't do that. It's only gonna look at what you're referring to. And it's again, it's only looking for a specific amount of, of cases that can mutate. And I think that's one of the things that I was a little bit confused about with mutation testing is, is this just some random wild process that's going on that feels Un untethered or that there's there's no constraints upon this, right. which to me then means, well, how do you get anything meaningful, meaningfully out of it? But if you look at the list of mutations that it does, it's, it's very specific. You know, like I think, for example, they'll, they'll do things with arithmetic operations, um, literal string constants. They'll do things with link. So, for example, if you had a take link operator in your code, it's going to change it to a skip. I see because that should should potentially fail a test. So, right. and, and that's the thing too to keep in mind with all this is that 
there there are cases where it's going to mutate your code and the mutation isn't killed, but that doesn't mean that your test or your code is wrong either. I've ran into a couple of cases where I've, I've looked at what it comes up with. And the, the, the point is that the analysis of what Stryker gives you, I think has to have a little bit of human intervention and say, okay. well, wait a minute, this is okay. Like I, I have a test around this. And even though this, like there was a, an operation I found where I was doing a, a less than, and it said, well, I'm gonna change that to a less than or equal and none of my tests failed. But the way I was using it in my code, you know, long story short, that was okay. So, but there's been, you know, I've been using this and playing with this on a bunch of repositories that I have in GitHub. Mm -hmm. And it's been interesting to see some, you know, sometimes it's like, yeah, I, I am missing these things or I didn't quite cover these cases correctly. So I think that so that's the nice the, thing about the tool. It's really the, that to keep in mind is it's pointing to potential problems. And then you as a human being have to decide whether that really is a problem. For for example, in the example you mentioned, less than or equal might have been the correct thing to do. Maybe, maybe your code was wrong and changing yeah. it to, uh, from less than to less than equal actually made it better. Yeah. It's, well, uh, and, sort and of one of the things. Story. And it, it sometimes of, doesn't break anything. It just uh, because that's yeah. nobody's nobody's hitting that exact value. It, right. And like another thing, too, is if I was throwing an exception and I was putting a message in the exception, what it would do is say, oh, you have this interpolated string. So I'm actually gonna change that to an empty string. And uh -huh. that should fail because, well, that's what you had in there. So somebody should be looking for this, okay? Uh -huh. Now, true, it's actually right in that it, it it's changing things in a way that's unexpected. And so the right thing I should have been doing in my tests is asserting not only am I getting the exception, but that the message looks like this. Especially if you're doing things like internationalization, maybe your message changes based on the culture that your code is running under and you wanna have a different message in there. Um, but the re, you know, how important is that too? You know, do you real, you know, how much do you care about knowing that the message is exactly this? Sure. So, you know, it, it's one of those things that you do have to weigh. I, honestly, I put in all my tests and I change them to look at the message because my core mantra with testing is if you have code that you have in a library or an application, it's there for a reason. And mm -hmm. therefore you should test what the code is actually doing. So when Stryker finds these things, yes, you, you should probably go in and, and change what the test is doing. But I also know there's, you know, people screaming from the audience going, but I'm under a I'm under pressure. I need to get these features out. I, you know, I I don't have time then to change these right things, which I understand. I, you know, what I would really say about tools like Striker is, and and unit testing in general, is get it into your process as soon as you start writing code, because then it's it's less painful to make any changes to things. You know, as as if if you don't do these activities, these principles, in your code base. And you try to do this six months, a year, two years down the line, it can be right. overwhelming to try to add it in. Uh, is Striker an open source tool? Is it a commercial product yep. or what? Or both? Yep, it's open source. So you can for for all the the languages and you know, like for .NET, you again just install it like a .NET tool. Um, they have all their code out in GitHub. So yeah, and if and if you use it for like one of the things I'm really adamant about open source is if you're using it within a company is contribute back in some way, shape or form. You know, these people are working hard to make these products and, and do these things for everybody. So you reap the benefits, let them reap some benefits as well and help them out. Yeah, I found the site, striker with a Y dash mutator.io. Yep, that's the one. And I also found that the reason I, one reason why I haven't heard of it is it just migrated to .NET in 2018. So it's relatively yep. new to the platform that you and I work in mostly. Yeah, exactly. So this is a, a newer thing, and and I'm glad that you picked this as a as a topic to discuss because hopefully more people start looking at this. And 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 it's funny too. Um, I was just talking to somebody internally about uh, this person's writing, looking at writing a blog article for our technology blog, and we just so happened to stumble upon the fact that he's also looking at Striker. And seeing if you can build it into um, our continuous integration processes, 
so that people can just add it in very simply to what they're doing and start getting reports on it. So, the, you know, I'm, I'm glad that more people are starting to hear about this and starting to think about how can they use this to make sure that their tests are as good as they can be. Oh, very good. Well, I'm, I'm learning that now. And then uh, the people watching this, which is literally numbers in the tens of viewers. <laughs> this is going oh, to those masses. So we're getting the word out. But that's more than zero. Yeah, so that's good. Zero. That's yeah. great. Very cool to zero. <laughs> uh, and so uh, your your full time in dev dev developer relations now, which means you're blogging and speaking more than even more than you used to, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I think this year it's going to be even more. Again, with the pandemic last year, you know, I joined a company with the intention of doing what you think of as traditional dev rel things, and all of a sudden. Oh, you can't travel anywhere, and you you know writing yes, but you, you know it it really changed the landscape, especially with something that you were just trying to start in a in a new company. So right. that was that was a little bit of a struggle, but now you know I'm start I'm actually going to be flying in about two weeks to a conference that's going to be in person, and Where's that's that? that's a Nebraska code, so right. that's in the middle of July, and then I'm also going to be speaking at that conference and Cincy Deliver. At the end of July, and so I'll be virtual at that conference. Okay, but it's it's nice to see that some of these things are actually starting to get back in person because I I mean I this is fine like what you and I are doing is what I've been doing for about the past year, um, and being able to speak at conferences or user groups online is fine, but I miss that real in person interaction you know with with people in the audience and uh, and afterwards and having conversations I really do miss that so um, hopefully that will start to become even more of a thing in, in the near future. Yeah, hopefully you and I can get together and share that beverage we talked about earlier. Exactly, exactly. All right, Jason, thank you so much for your time and thanks for the allowing me to learn something new. Yeah, you're welcome and thanks for having me. Is there a correlation between friends that you choose and the technology that they use. <laughs>